Good morning, everyone. Happy to see that at least some of you are here. Uh, so yeah, domains of grays, just a really bad pun. You don't want to know why. So who am I? I am the complete insane person who came up with this basic concept. Nick here is the guy who actually made it usable. Couldn't have done it without him. Uh, Nick is in the program, but he didn't submit his bio until like two weeks after the programs were printed or something. So, Nick, you want to introduce yourself at all? No? You're good. All right. So, the basic concept here that we're working with is your standard phishing attack. So, I'm sure if any one of you opens up your email right now, you'll see something trying this. This is very common. You have your basic idea where someone tries to fish you, they include a link, hey, you need to reset your account information or whatever, some pretext in order to get you to go to their website and fill in the information that they want to steal from you. This is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly common and really it's been endemic for years and years and years now. Uh, I'm sure that everyone knows or knows of someone who's been victimized by this particular kind of attack. This is the, uh, this is the bog standard, uh, vaguely social engineering, vaguely technical attack. And I mean, quite frankly, it pisses me off just because there's no reason why this should still be working. It's incredibly obvious if you take the time to look, but unfortunately, most users don't take the time to look. The problem here is that training is really ineffective most of the time. Uh, I'm sure that any one of you who have worked in, in military or corporate uh, are very deeply familiar with the information security training that tells you to evaluate emails and not just blindly fill things out. But unfortunately, well, it just doesn't happen that way. No, this is your slide. No, you, you go. Fine, fine. He's shy. Uh, so small and medium businesses are really heavily affected by this. The, the large enterprises, large corps, they tend to have some resources to at least mitigate this or people to clean up after it happens to them. Uh, small and medium businesses, they don't really have the budget for continual training remedial training, remedial, remedial training. Hey, how many layers deep do you want to go with that? Yeah. It's, it's just, it's horrible. It, it, phishing keeps working. Um, and all you red teamers out there, you know this very well. And it seems like nine tenths of the time when you hear someone who's red teaming talking about what they did to get into a given network, it starts with, so I fished them and then, it's the gateway. It's, it's your gateway hack, except it's not really a hack, is it? It's just social engineering obscured slightly by uh, a little network happiness. So ultimately, phishing keeps working. Like I said, this pisses me off. So let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the existing ways that we try to counter phishing. Yes, that one's yours. All right. Some of the usual ways we do it is mail header rewrites. Um, we can call out emails as they come in, but uh, yeah, we actually expect people to notice that and do something about it. Uh, but oftentimes they don't. Uh, we have spam filters which uh, they partly mitigate it, but sometimes, especially in SMB, if you're actually running your own spam filter, like, it is not the best of situations. Uh, you're still gonna get these coming through. Uh, we have blacklisting, which is, for the most part, unaffordable um, for small businesses. It's not the easiest thing to get running. Um, it takes a while. Yeah, and if you don't already know what's coming, blacklisting doesn't help. Uh, and then we have whitelisting, which 
also hurts. It really hurts because who do you know you're talking to until, you know, if, if you ever want to talk to someone other than your current customers, whitelisting is really not going to do much for you. Yeah. So uh, most businesses want to expand, at least a little bit. Hopefully. <laughs> so this is one of the common reactions that we see. Uh, people get frustrated. It's, it's inevitable that people really, really hate how often phishing works. And, and the time between when you notice even a good systems administrator, when they notice that phishing is coming in, they end up having to race to block their own people's access to it. And it, it, it's obvious that this is not just a problem for your company. Other people are getting hurt by this. And you know, I, I'm dedicated blue team here, yes. I am the sworn enemy of all you red team people, even if I do like you socially. But, Ultimately, there's, there's a very deep level of frustration on the defensive side because it just keeps happening. It's going to keep happening. It takes way too long to get them taken down. Even if it's only a couple hours before they're taken down, that's too long. People take only a, a, a couple seconds to click and start entering information. That's harm. We want to minimize that. So let's, let's analyze how these, these phishing campaigns work a little bit. Let's take a, a good solid look at what kind of system they use. What do they depend on to do their work? So we have logistical requirements. Uh, phishing can't happen without some kind of server for the victim to get to. Uh, it's usually a website. It may be co-opted infrastructure. Uh, my, my three years dead blog blogspot.com or something like that. Uh, someone's uh, DC forum or whatever that's been compromised. Uh, or they may well just rent a VPS in Estonia or Latvia or some other place that doesn't have extradition with the US. Uh, bulletproof hosting in, in the Netherlands. There's a lot of places you can put this. But you need time and effort to acquire it and you need some kind of means of running it. Because as much as, as much as these guys are on the attack, this kind of basic infrastructure makes them kind of defensive, if you will. It gives us a, a way to attack them. You can have them taken down uh, by legal means, uh, or you can have uh, the AS uh, blacklisted for uh, routing purposes. All sorts of good things you can do. But ultimately, the challenge here is to figure out they're, in, they're, in, they're not in this just for the lulls, usually. They're in this to make money. The credentials they're harvesting get sold or used elsewhere. And in some fashion, that is profitable to them. So if we can make their expenses go up, and if we can make their profits go down as a result, this harms their business. So keep that in mind a little bit. Uh, like the Grug says, attackers have budgets too. That's, that's a real key concept to keep in mind here. So how is it when you get a fish that your user ends up actually getting to them? So the fish has to hit your mail server, which spam filtering does help somewhat here. Uh, and the user has to go and click on the link, even though we tell them not to, they still do it. So when the user clicks on the link, what happens here? The, the, the browser opens up, it fills in the information from the link, it fetches DNS, finds the server, goes out there. Hey, wait a second here. It fetches DNS. Your user's workstation has to resolve the attacker's domain. That is something you control. And this is why password managers, for instance, uh, password managers don't get fooled by this. Because your typical password manager here is something that is it's relatively simple. It looks at the specific page that you're going to. And it 
looks at its database and says, okay, I have this credential uh, entry associated with this particular page. So in this particular case, it's not going to get fooled. Now, it may look just like your bank's website. It may look exactly pixel perfect. They may even have not put in a typo. But if the domain isn't the same, your phishing uh, is not going to work on a password manager. So the problem here, though, I would love to have absolutely everyone run password managers. It's a beautiful thing. It solves so many problems. But unfortunately, there's a lot of distrust of them. There's a lot of people who are very, very deeply suspicious, especially of the, the, the cloud-based ones, that they consider that to be an unacceptable risk to them. Now, personally, I'm of a mind that the risk that they ameliorate, the risk that they solve, is orders of magnitude larger than the risk from any individual password manager getting breached. But that's an argument for another time. And what's worse, though, is there's a lot of folks out there, banks especially are notorious for this, who make it their, their they do their level best to try and mess with us. They, they throw in stupid JavaScript to block pasting. Or if you paste something, they'll just immediately delete it. And it's, if, you, if you call them out on this, if you say, hey, guys, you're blocking password managers, they're like, yes, but it's for security reasons. For security reasons, they, they block the thing that keeps people secure. OK. So the, the, the problem here is I can't go and control them. I can't control my bank deciding, eh, for security reasons, we'll just block pasting. Can't do that. But what we can control is the DNS on our end. And that's something that, uh, that we'll get into in, in more depth a little bit later. But the thing to remember is there are things you can control. There are things you can't. And if you really want to be effective, you have to focus on those that you can. Now, a little background here. Um, I love blacklists. I really love blacklists. Blacklists are my friend. And if you follow me on the Twitters or something, you'll see me talking about this all the time, how DNS blacklisting is a really great ad block measure. Just because all these ad domains, they're really reasonably well known. And if you want to get rid of these ads, if you want to keep them from even showing up, you can re redirect your local DNS to sinkhole them. This gets a lot of fun. Uh, it breaks a lot of things. And interestingly enough, uh, it causes some uh, anti-ad blocking uh, scripts to get upset. But unfortunately, blacklisting is reactive. It's expensive to do. It's expensive computationally in some cases. Uh, but it, it just doesn't work until you know that the threat is there. But an interesting thing about this particular threat, uh, early in the 20th century, back around 2000 to 2003, uh, phishing domains and other related scam domains, they tended to be live for about a week. We've done a lot towards getting those taken down in the past 15 years. And as such, these days, most of these phishing domains only live, uh, as of 2014, for 24 hours. So this gets to the point where we can practically do something, we've narrowed the window that they're allowed to operate in. And now let's narrow it a little bit further. Phishing is very much a short con. They are in it to win it, yes, but they only have a narrow window of opportunity to do so. Everyone is trying to get rid of these guys, and they know it, and they have adapted, they move faster. 
the whole move fast and break things thing works really great for these guys because that, that fits their business model. These are not your, your, your suave scammers who infiltrate and, and schmooze and eventually run off with the whole casino vault. These are the hustlers on the street who are doing a more or less a, a gentle mugging. They are only interested in interacting with you for as long as it takes to get your information. They're not invested in this. They just want to grab and, and dash. So keeping that in mind, keeping in mind the very short window of opportunity that they have to do anything, keeping in mind the pressures that they're under, and keeping in mind that there are aspects of their workflow that you control. Here's the core concept. If you can control your DNS, and if you can keep things that are suspicious from resolving long enough, then phishing stops working. If, the, if their page gets taken down or abandoned or otherwise left off after that 24 hours, and you've delayed resolution on your network for that 24 hours, phishing no longer works. This is a way to block their window of opportunity. They can't work with that. So, and you're up next here, there are a few prerequisites. You're going to have to actually control your infrastructure. So, in your network, if you're allowing DNS to resolve just straight through to the internet, it's probably not the best thing. Um, what we did is we wrote a small program that sits there in between your actual DNS resolver and looks at the time window when things were requested. Um, basically, you want everything to go through it. It's probably the easiest way. Uh, just egress filtering, too. What's it? Egress filtering. Yeah. 53 needs to be uh, filtered outbound because if you, you can't let things just hang out, going out to the internet by themselves. Uh, funny little anecdote, a particular client I was working with uh, had not yet implemented egress filtering. They found out that their sprinkler controller was requesting DNS from Russia. So that's, that's not usually what you want for a sprinkler controller unless it's some of that really heavy Chernobyl water. You need that, right? <laughs> yeah, anyway, standard network controls. Um, you want to put the gray list in front of your DNS. Um, you really want to make sure everything resolves through that. Let's see. This uh, is definitely a proof of concept. <laughs> Yeah, I would not run in production yet, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a proof of concept that runs gray listing, um, we have black listing support, white listing support. Um, basically, what we've done is we, you point your DNS resolution to it, and if we don't know what it is, we're just going to point it at, um, I guess, a predefined IP. Yeah, you can country. configure it. Yeah. Uh, we're defaulting to localhost just because that's the stupidest and laziest way to do it. But uh, if you have, for instance, uh, some kind of internal infrastructure that you would like to use uh, in cases where you'd like, for instance, uh, to interface with the help desk or what have you, you could easily point it to a local server on which you have some kind of landing page that will accept whatever and say, hey, this has been gray listed. Talk to your help desk. Yep. And also, um, let's keep in mind that uh, this being a proof of concept, these things do evolve and change over time. Uh, it is something that needs extensive baselining uh, in order to work because, uh, as you found out, uh, like Google Authenticator had issues with it because yep. uh, it flips through a whole bunch of domains during its request process. Uh, Baselining it is something that is either you're going to have to just keep on making requests, or if you want to 
you could, for instance, uh, throw a span or a mirror port off of some local uh, network device uh, or just IP tables with a T uh, and throw your, your DNS traffic over to it for a day or two before you actually put this in line. Uh, and that would enable it to baseline your network into its, uh, its database. Uh, further, you're going to want to populate the whitelist with your local domain because it, the, the nature of this is such that we want to resolve any whitelisted entries immediately without having to go through the trouble of evaluating whether we've seen it before. So whitelist, blacklist, gray list, whitelist, your local stuff, any people you know are good, blacklist, if you really don't want to see something, we'll just reject it, gray listing, well, that's where we're doing other fun things. Yep. Yeah. Basically, if you can monitor your stuff and put it in there first, kind of pre-warm it, then everything will run a little bit better. Uh, we do have drawbacks, though. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you actually have to run everything through it. Uh, if everybody's resolving their own DNS, who knows what's going on? You have to have one centralized point for it. Uh, and yeah, as mentioned, some of the uh, single sign-on stuff sometimes breaks um, because they push you through a couple different domains to get that working. Um, but pre-warming it uh, allows that to be mitigated. Should. One, once all, should. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Once all the domains are populated into the gray list and they've aged enough to be allowed, uh, it tends to work out really well. Uh, and as it happens, we've set a default uh, blackout date of, uh, what was it, 180 hours? I think so. Sounds about right. It is seven days, essentially. So if you've hit it within the last seven days, it continues to persist within the gray list. That's the basic notion. So if it is something you keep using, then it will stay live. If you stop using it, if, uh, for instance, uh, you were uh, associating with a given company, that company goes out of business, then after seven days or so, after you stop going to that company's website, uh, it, stopped, it falls out of the gray list, which is pretty handy because there have been instances where companies have gone out of business and someone else has grabbed the domain after it expired, used the now familiar domain that's probably still whitelisted in a lot of places, and proceeded to fish people for all sorts of gain. It's a fun attack. Yeah. Um, also, there's the whole gray list part that you know we actually are doing. Yes. After 24 hours, I believe, by default, is when we actually resolve things. Right, well, there's, there's the initial gray out period of 24 hours. Uh, where in the first 24 hours it's going to resolve locally or not resolve at all. Depends on how you want to set it up. And that, that 24 hours to seven days window is, is essentially the active window. And as mentioned, if you keep going there, it's going to keep essentially sliding that active window to seven days in the future. Um. Yeah, and then probably the worst thing we've noticed in testing, things like Reddit are just really going to break because you're just popping up different domains all the time. And uh, Most business users are only going to be visiting a handful of domains at a time, though. I mean, you're... For business. For business, yes. If they're, if they're surfing Reddit on business networks, well, maybe they deserve a little pain. So... <laughs> As it happens, we'll, we'll expand this a little bit now because other things break because of this. Some of them usefully. Botnet CNC is one of those hilarious things. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar at this point with all those love of, lovely uh, domain generation algorithms all the fancy botnets use these days, uh, where in order to keep their CNC agile, their command and control, they can't keep their CNC staying on one domain. Everyone is hammering it, trying to get rid of them through legal means or otherwise. So they dodge around a lot. But that's an opportunity for us. Because since they're flipping through domain names at a rate that's 
entirely too fast for, for blacklisting. This means that their domains don't persist long enough for a gray list to allow them. So botnet CNC is going to stop being effective if your network is protected in this fashion. Uh, so the, it, it, it gives some interesting second order side effects. And there's the typo squatting is another one. Uh, I don't know if you all recall, but there's, uh, there's that lovely controversy that came up recently where someone went and typo squatted a bunch of uh, code repo domains and proceeded to, uh, the thing that was controversial was that he went and put a generic script in there that popped an error when you downloaded that script. So typo squatting works because People, people don't always enter in the correct domain. But as with the, uh, as mentioned earlier, with the um, password uh, managers, the machine's a little bit dumb. The machine just gives what it's supposed to give. And we can take advantage of that. Uh, so if you fat finger GitHub or whatever, then it's not going to be effective. It will resolve locally. You'll notice your script breaks and happiness ensues. I think the best one's where you can't actually get the uh, crypto locker key because it won't resolve. That one's fun. And actually that fits into the next thing. This is a slide that uh, Stilgarian passed me from a, a presentation, um, I think it was Trend Micro down in Australia was giving uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the lines, the horrible lines are mine. That's not their fault. But their analysis uh, of ransomware delivery uh, shows some interesting ways in which you can control whether or not these things succeed. So obviously, with the malicious URL, if you can't visit the URL immediately, generally a phishing type act, uh, attack, then that's going to stop. The lovely downloaders, because you know, apparently we need JavaScript and email these days, which I think is a terrible mistake and should never have been implemented. But then again, I'm a boring person. Uh, those lovely JavaScript downloaders in Outlook and the preview pane and all that kind of other happiness won't resolve, and the attack's not going to work. Likewise, if someone does get full-on uh, ransomware, like you said, it can't communicate back to the mothership. It's not going to be able uh, to manage the full handshake. Now, there are a few variants these days that use a generic key, but because these, uh, these ransomware authors are, are lazy as well, they have shared their generic key for any system that does not resolve the command and control system which there's another weakness, there's something for you to exploit. So in a way, this, this, is, this is kind of interesting how many second order effects we're getting out of this uh, gray listing thing. And there's a lot of other areas that we could work with. This is just a very basic, uh, admittedly it's simplistic uh, concept we're working with, but the generalized approach is by controlling your infrastructure, you can diffuse a lot of attacks. You have to consent to being attacked. I mean, if you never hook up your computer to the network, no network-based attack is going to work. But you have to do that. You have to hook up the computer to a network to actually do business. So we get trade-offs. So if you do this kind of control, you're allowing yourself to dictate to the attacker under what conditions they are allowed to engage. And that there, that is, is a very strong defensive measure. Because now the attacker has to put a lot more time and effort into attacking you than they would otherwise. They can't use the low bars. They can't use the low-hanging fruit. 
they have to put in extra effort, and that alone dissuades some of them. The others who are actually dedicated to attacking you are forced to use uh, more sophisticated methods. They'll have to figure out some way to get around the gray listing on your end. There are a couple of obvious things, some of which we are addressing. Uh, naked IPs, for instance, you're going to have to uh, make sure you've got squid or something filtering those out. Uh, there's a, a fun little regular expression in the horror thing that allows you to do that. Um, but dictating the pace of the attack means that you have more time to respond to the attack. You can take more measures. And something which I didn't include on the slides, but is definitely in there, logging. We have the provision to write logs that tell you what is going on. If you see in your logs a whole bunch of initial gray listed uh, attempts by a whole bunch of computers on your network, you know something's weird. If you see that a whole bunch of computers belonging to the finance department uh, are suddenly hitting a gray listed entry, it is highly likely they're being fished trying to get your bank account credentials, that kind of thing. Uh, likewise, spear phishing of your executives that's going to show up in the logs. So we have the logs available, and it breaks them up uh, as to whether or not it's a, an allowed gray list, a forbidden gray list, a black list, or white list. Uh, so you have that visibility into what's going on into your network, which is a lovely tool. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to analyze DNS logs from Active Directory before, but it's not very easy. It takes a lot of time and effort, and it's really annoying. So, and I guess I've been speaking a little quickly because we're already to the payoff. Here's a repo. Here's a tool for you. Uh, it's very definitely proof of concept, and we would like a whole lot of feedback. We want people to try this out on their networks. We want to see how well this performs in real life, and if you want to give us some contributions to make this work better, please. I'm a terrible coder. He's much better than I am. Definitely. <laughs> I fixed it up as much as I could. So he took my horrible, nasty, awful, frankly awful proof of concept and, and, and made it into something vaguely acceptable. Sorry for the handicap. Um, and we would really like to see this go out into the world where it's open source. Feel free to take it and use it as you will. Um, feel free to adapt it to other things. Uh, personally, I would like to see it integrated into something like PFSense or other similar uh, distributions of that sort uh, because it would work well within that kind of suite. And if you have any suggestions on how to improve this, how to make it work better, I am all ears. I am more than happy to take your contributions, to take your criticism, uh, to take any suggestions and see what we can do about making this better. I'm actually just curious what happens when you run it on a full Yeah, we, 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 we'd like to see bigger network. Neither of us has a real big network to play with. So seeing how well this scales is going to be an interesting, uh, interesting challenge. Uh, so there's your basic concept. And if any of you have any questions, uh, we'd love to hear them. Latency. So that's that's a killer question right I there. Um, time that a little bit, and it's pretty much the resolution of the one machine, and then the next one. So um, if you're doing resolve conf, which is the default, um, I think it's like it, it's whatever pretty much your network latency is, basically doubled because it's going to go out and try and grab the next uh, the next response. So it's more in the order of milliseconds than minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, if it's gray listed, it's going to be more on the. Well, yes, if it's gray listed, hours. it's going to be a day, but. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for some networks, blocking uh, DNS outbound might break a lot of stuff. So, what about uh, the idea of using DNS Mask or some kind of transparent DNS proxy to filter all the requests through the gray list? Uh, that is. So, this is essentially a DNS proxy uh, in and of itself. 
uh, it's, it's a very simplistic one, and it's really more of a filter than anything else. But uh, yeah, it's, we're not looking to block all DNS outbound. I could find a way to do it in DNS mask, so. And DNS mask didn't let us do it, so. Yeah. Here's how we're doing it. I have kind of a similar question. It's, um, do you integrate with or uh, leverage response policy zones in bind? And if so, why not? Did you see um, a weakness in it or a problem with it? If we don't have it in our lists, then we're just going to resolve it to bind pretty much for the first part of that. Um, but you can talk about the weaknesses and stuff. Yeah. When, when you talk about volume and performance and scaling, um, our, our RPZ we've seen is a really good crutch to, to rely on. We see networks that resolve, you know, millions of domains at a shot. And when you implement RPZ, you might take like a 10% if ahead of time, but you can have a million domains in your blacklist and it won't miss a beat. But if 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 I I, I took a, a small look at that. I kind of got rid of it afterwards because it, it looked like it was just a blacklisting thing. No? No. It didn't look like it, it fit the problem when I was doing the research. So I could be wrong. This could be something that a clever bind configuration could well solve. But hey, let's, uh, let's try it out anyway. Uh, any other questions? No? Well, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for hearing me blab away for a little shorter than I was scheduled, I guess. Uh, oh, go ahead. That, 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 was, that was not a, a, uh, a condemnation of Estonia. I was just looking through Eastern European countries in my head, and that was one of the ones that came up. My, 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 my apologies if I offended the Estonian community. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it's a lovely country. I've just never been there. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, my thanks to all of you for being here and for uh, listening to me blab on and on. Uh, my thanks to all of you who I harassed into coming here and who actually did. And uh, if you want to find me on the Twitter, uh, you can find me at Munin. Uh, if you want to talk to him, you're probably going to have to find me first because he doesn't hang out there. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, I am on the Pure List uh, deal. So if you want to uh, go to our lovely uh, post-convention discussion sponsor person at PeerList, uh, you'll be able to find me there. And uh, we can continue the conversation there. Uh, or you can always catch me after the talk. And I will be wandering around. Although if you are not scared by my horrifying socks, then uh, you probably should be. So it's great to see you all. And thank you for coming.